the Swiss have proven, especially the Swatch Group, that they can produce huge quantities of products in Switzerland. So it's not like everything has to come from elsewhere. Swatch watches are to a very high percentage actually produced in Switzerland, you know, especially the movement, the case, some of the components. And so that was the point of the whole Swatch exercise by Hayek to prove that you could make millions and millions of the same product in Switzerland and you could still turn a profit and you could offer it at a very low price. On this week's show, there are watches, more watches and even moon swatches. But all that is important is that I get to do more than just this intro. But you have to listen right to the end to hear that. Enjoy the show. Greetings and welcome to this week's A Blog to Watch Weekly. Ariel is in midair on his way to France. So he'll be doing his movie reviews this time next week. But we're joined by the ever-present, the man who I think of most when I think of Scottish... And the man I think of most when I think of watches. So there you go. He's he's the summation of Scottishness and watches all in one go. It's Alex, the watch regulator from Fifth Rush Radio. Good morning, Alex. Good evening. Good evening, even. I think yes. we need to change the name to a blog to watch weekly with the watch regulator now because I've been on so much. You think? Yeah. You think with Ariel, Rick, Alex, and David? Yeah. You think we need to I- expand the pantheon? Mm-hmm. We'll, we'll take that under due consideration. <laughs> David, how are you this morning? <laughs> <laughs> I am very well and how's things for you, Rick? Not bad at all. Now, David, you have a confession to make because when I edited last week's audio, I discovered that during the show you were doing what exactly? Yeah, uh, so I'm in the middle of moving house, <laughs> and that is basically a desperate time that calls for desperate measures. And it is true that I was hoovering at the time for at least some of the some of the recording. But you know, <laughs> thank you, thank you for the for the tight edits, Rick. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, normally I have to edit out sirens from the show, but last week it was hoovering, so yeah. uh, we may we we do have a mega mix that we will play once you've moved. You know, we'll introduce sirens back into the show just so that it, you know it feels like home. <laughs> well, lots on this week's show, but we're going to start off with an article to do with micro brands, and this is by Jake. And it's called, from the comments, when do we drop the micro from micro brand? Now, Ari was not here, so I asked ChatGPT when the term micro brand was first used in the watch. ChatGPT tells me it was around 2010. Does anybody have any advance on 2010? David, you've been in this game longer than I have. Do you recall the term micro brand from early in the 2000s or the 1990s? No, definitely not. No, even even if even if they were a thing in their own way, I mean, it's funny because sometimes I'm browsing these archives of Basel World releases and yeah. press releases and stuff from the 2000s and late 90s, and there are so many wonky little brands that don't even exist anymore and that n- literally nobody talks about anymore. Some were worse than the others, and and you know there were some gems in there too, and they never really got traction, and they they had like one collection or two collections, but. But not micro brands as such, no. So when I say micro brand, uh, Alex, what do you think of? It's kind of confusing a lot of the time because you have to do your own research to work out what it actually means. And is it just a, a blog that's calling them a micro brand, or actually are they a micro brand? But I tend to think of watches manufactured in Asia, maybe attached to some resuscitated historic swiss name but i do tend to think of good value for what you get compared to similar priced watches from the big swiss guys is it a creation of logistics of the internet that because somebody sitting in their bedroom in birmingham can order something from a movement manufacturer or case builder in Hong Kong and it's that that's made it happen that that's really where the explosion has been and you had to call it something so micro brand was what it became there's definitely some truth to that for sure because I get messages from people saying do you want to I think they normally message me when they're drunk though and they say do you want to start a micro brand (laughs) but yeah it's kind of the internet 
the same way it's made news channels obsolete and empowered people to start conspiracy theorist channels like it just empowers people to do what they want to do so definitely when you can email someone in hong kong and have a, a case and a bracelet made then yeah there has to be some of that to it and david has people's attitude changed over the period particularly in the brands themselves have they gone from liking being called a micro brand to now trying to say oh no no i'm not a micro brand that's an interesting question i think it really depends on the brand and the approach some of them are like sure this is what we are because we know there are people out there who are looking for exactly what we have to offer and others are like no no, no this is not this is not what we are and what we do just precisely because they understand that there are some customers who are looking for something else so it really depends it's you know these waters are getting muddled up but that, that's okay so is the key thing for a micro brand then the pricing like if you're going to try and say is mb and f not a micro brand because it turns over so much money or is it not a micro brand because the watches are expensive does it fit the other micro brand definitions of being small volume one guy small business i i is there a line that can be drawn or is it just a dotted line and the reality is people are just going to use a term we're all going to argue about it and that's what makes life interesting mm. is there actual watchmaking that's taken place that's the thing though or is it just kind of still mass produced stuff right i think that's the line between micro brands and independents it's there's still some watchmaking or finishing that goes into the kind of higher end stuff i don't think it's just about money it's about that human intervention rather than a load of cases being delivered from from asia and thrown together someplace else so if you can build a watch and sell a watch and never actually have it in your possession you're basically drop shipping it is that the best definition of a micro brand mm. is there anybody that falls outside of that i mean I, again i asked chat gpt who are the original micro brands it gave me a list baltic halios farrer Zelos, Undone, Helsen, Martinero, and Spinnaker. It's mm. not a bad list, to be fair, to the world of AI. But would all of them now be considered micro brands? They're still producing in small qual uh, quantities, though, right? Or selling in small yeah. quantities compared to the big guys. Maybe that's the real micro part of it, is they're just the, the scale at which they're operating is just so insignificant compared to the millions of units that the the big boys are doing yeah i think it, it's it's not about the price point i i would also bring into the number of collections that they have i wouldn't qualify uh, qualify mbnf as a micro brand because they have cre so many what's the different uh, creations and some of them they have been producing for uh, you know a series of years like a certain legacy machines and stuff that they're that are not one time you know, you know releases or but uh, more of a staple for the company and so yeah I, I think it's more about diversity and uh, and and persistence and uh, and and all those things as opposed to just uh, all the rest that we talked about we see some of these smaller brands which we would maybe term micro brands growing up like was christopher ward originally a micro brand and now most definitely isn't yeah i guess that's fair probably probably yeah. Are we still seeing as many, though, coming in at the bottom end? I mean, I think there's now a very distinct Kickstarter section in the microbrand world. It's the kind of one and done. They're going to make one watch and you're never going to hear from them again. So I don't think you can call it a brand because it never repeats. It never gets into public consciousness. Whereas Spinnaker, well, it's a brand. People know it. But, you know, guy who creates one thing on Kickstarter, that's not a brand. It's just a Kickstarter watch. But could it be a brand at some point, though? That's the thing, right? Yeah, if it repeats the trick. Yeah. The question is, as brands move up from whoever the definition of micro brand is and become bigger brands and employ more people and very definitely are not micro brands anymore, like a Christopher Ward or a Fears or an ordain to think of some local ones around here you could probably consider all of them micro brands to begin with is there still the stuff coming in at the bottom end or has everyone just kind of got fed up like is this era of time from the 2010s the 2020s going to be considered that was a time of micro brands and actually it's just moved on 
it's one and done guys now there, there's not the same number coming in i thought it was interesting um, when you were asking david earlier about his memory of micro brands because he's been in the industry for longer than than us and i wanted to ask him has the quality of the product improved over time and so for that reason like truly as time goes by it's easier for people to create micro brands because more and more people are doing it more suppliers are open to that idea but has the offering i think the offering personally has got better but um what does david think about the, the micro brands quality yeah that's a good question i, I think it really depends on the quality of the suppliers <laughs> it's uh and you know the, the, a lot of these suppliers especially in asia they have had they, they have overcome you know like a lot of uh, quality issues and have come uh, a long long way but part of the reason for that is because some swiss you know mid-tier or entry-level luxury brands have outsourced at least some of their uh, production to them and you know of course you can outsource and you can have them sign an nda and do whatever else but you know we've seen this with technology and with all kinds of other consumer pro uh, electronics and other products that sure you can do this for a while but other but sooner or later this will trickle down and and other brands will benefit from the know-how that you have exported uh, for the sake of manufacturing to other countries and um this is not against those countries or any of this this is just a, a natural progression of quality and this is what the uh, uh, at least some of these micro brands have benefited from what you were saying earlier rick about the is it time to, what did you say? Is it time to remove micro from micro brands? Yeah. Hmm. I was thinking, because I was reading through the, the article and it almost made it seem like micro brand was a bad, bad word. And do we need to stop yes. using it? Is it time we removed Swiss from Swiss made? What about that? Well, it, it, it is the week of Toblerone exactly. Gate. Chocolate, chocolate Gate. How can Toblerone get on top of, um, or how can <laughs> Swiss get on top of Toblerone being made outside of Switzerland and taking the, the mountain off it and the watch industry can't? Because I was watching a video from Teddy Baldassar and he was at uh -huh. the Tissot fact it was kind of like a tiso factory tour i think it was yeah, yeah and they yeah. were saying they produce four million watches a year and they have 200 watchmakers and my brain was doing the uh the crazy math <laughs> stuff and all the pieces of string connecting trying to work it out <laughs> and um uh -huh. yeah i just thought maybe it's the time to if, let's sort out the the honesty and integrity within the watch industry get on top of that before we start worrying about things like micro brands let's get the basics sorted and sorted out first before we worry too much about is is micro brand a, a bad word says our favorite daniel wellington exactly. watchmaker. <laughs> so well I, I mean it is a good point i mean it's up to each country to decide when it allows people to use the phrase made in that country and you've got america which is incredibly strict about it and you know unless it, i think unless it's basically a hundred percent then you can't say it's made in america whereas you can say it's made in switzerland is it 60 percent currently of value value yeah yeah uh, i think is the number i don't know what it is in the uk but it varies all over the world i'm not sure what it says about toblerone Presumably the rule is the same for Toblerone. Is it 60%? Like 60% of the chocolate? How does that work? Is it the packaging? The cost The cost of the packaging? <laughs> like the cost of a watch case? It's all interconnected nah. probably. It, it's, it's a, I was, I, I think I told this story um, in like a few dozen episodes before. I'm not sure. Uh -huh. I was at the Hong Kong Watch and Clock for a few years ago. And there was this technical director of this smaller group that has like, you know, half a dozen or so different brands under its umbrella. And, you know, one of these watches, uh, you know, it was on the table and it was a skeletonized watch and it was priced at around, I don't want to lie, or something like 180 pounds or something like that. And then uh -huh. the exact same watch was next to it, maybe with a different color hour marker or something like that, different color strap. And it's a Swiss made on it and it was 360 pounds. But, you know, the case was the same. The hands were the, the same. The movement was the same. The straps were the same. So I asked the, the, him, like, how, how do you qualify for Swiss made? And he said, well, you know, we make the entire watch, basically. And then we ship it over to Switzerland where they change the balance wheel and maybe the balance spring. And those two components are so freaking expensive to make in Switzerland <laughs> that uh -huh. with that, and I'm not saying that maybe they have juggled a bit with the numbers and stuff, but... But, you know, it's not that difficult yeah. to make an entire watch in Asia, ship it over and then replace two parts with the 
hourly rate of a Swiss switch maker <laughs> who does this and, and these components and boom, there you have, there you have it, 60% of the value. So that totally happens and I, I've seen it with my own eyes. I've seen other brands uh, do this as well and it, it totally is a thing. So that, that's one of the things. But what you said about Tissot and the number of watchmakers versus the number of uh, watches made, let's not forget about Swatch. So I think, you know, the Swiss have proven, especially the Swatch group, that they can produce huge quantities of products reasonably well in Switzerland, uh, you know, through the economy of scale and, and, and the rest of it. So it's not like everything has to come from elsewhere. I'm not sure. I, I, I'm really not sure. But I believe that Swatch watches are to a, to a very high percentage um, actually produced in Switzerland, you know, especially the movement, the case, some of the components, at least on, on a lot of those watches. And so that was the point of the whole Swatch exercise by Hayek to prove that you could make millions and millions of the same product in Switzerland and you could still turn a profit and you could offer it at a very low price. Are there any groups that you would consider like a Swatch group that own micro brands? Like, is it possible to be considered a micro brand while owned by a bigger umbrella or is the whole idea of a micro brand that it must stand on its own two feet i i personally prefer the term like owner driver or owner operator mm. is a watch brand owned by the person and operated by the person that's making the decisions or is it just a marketing exercise, you know, an assemblage of pieces, much like a watch? It's just a, I'll bring a bit of expertise from here, a bit of expertise, and I'll combine it all together and I'll just print the money at the end of it. Some some Swatch Group brands do have a micro brands feel to them. I'm thinking Mido and Certina, which I'm sure have much bigger footprints in, in other countries, but they do seem to have, I don't know, less, less staff, less management than the other big guys in, in the Swatch group. But then you could say the same for Breggy Blancpain, and they're, you w then you wouldn't ever class classify them as a micro brand, or I certainly wouldn't. But I think the kind of lesser known brands within Swatch group that have a bit more movement and there's less eyes on them so they can do things a bit differently than the, the, the big guys like Omega. Is there an enthusiast angle then to all of this? That actually somebody mainstream, somebody who just wants to buy a watch is never going to come across a micro brand, but we would come across micro brands and consider buying them because the marketing budget to get in front of the eyeballs of Joe public versus the fact that they get on to our eyeballs because we're on Instagram and follow a load yeah. of watch people and somebody in the watch community picks it up. So oh, look at this new thing that's coming out. So we eventually all see it. And so there's a kind of word of mouth element to being a micro brand. So that's it. It's just unless it, the brand wouldn't exist if it were not for the enthusiast community. Oh, that sounds like a decent definition. What do we think, David? If a brand could only exist because of the enthusiast community, then it's a micro brand. Hmm. I like that. I'm sure most of the micro brands would love it too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that is us put to bed the world of micro brands. But as has just been raised, we're now going to put to bed the world of Swatch. And in particular, what is about to be released upon us in merely an hour or so, which is something new from the world. Maybe maybe this is a micro brand. Is Moon Swatch a <laughs> micro brand of its own? Mm, maybe for discussion. Anyway, here we go. So we're going to do a bit of a trick here. We're going to try and record what we think is going to happen. And then after it happens, we're going to jump back on, do a wee 60 seconds each of what we think of what has actually come to fruition. So Alex, in an hour and a half's time, what do you expect to come out of the world of Moonswatch and how much do you expect it to be? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, it's, this is a funny one because I was telling our the producer from our podcast, producer Sebastian, that I was coming on and that was going to be talking about the... We all know that he produces all watch podcasts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's the invisible hand behind it all. Exactly. He was telling me, he said, oh, you predicted the Golden Moon Swatch in some episode. And I was like, I must have been drunker than normal in that one because I did not remember it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I guess the question in my, first pops into my mind is how does bioceramic work with a gold color is it going to be pvd coated or how, it's 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 interesting to see how it's going to play out or is it just going to be 
I guess it is plastic at the end of the day, so they can just mix some gold glitter in it or something. But um, it's a bit strange to me that they're pumping out another one so soon when there's still people struggling or complaining about not being able to get an actual Moon Swatch from the first release. But I guess they're like, well, let's let's make this happen. Let's keep this let's keep this party going. I don't think it I think it might be slightly more expensive than the other ones. Maybe by twenty or thirty dollars. But I don't think it's gonna be anything crazy because at the end of the day it's it's not gonna be an actual gold watch. So Okay, well let, let's actually scoreboard this then between the three of us. So we're gonna have a specific prediction for what is the material? Is there gonna be real gold in it? Yes or no? And what is the price point going to be? So, Alex, is there going to be real gold in this? God, after me just saying a, a matter of seconds ago that there wouldn't be gold <laughs> in it, now I'm thinking the fact that they're calling it moonshine gold yeah. makes me think they're actually going to put real gold in it, even though it might be a very, very small amount. Because <laughs> I, I don't know how much ceramic is in bioceramic. I know that one of the watchmakers at work had one, and I asked uh-huh. him if I could um, play around with it. I took my, I took, I took my um, kind of Stanley knife that I use for cutting uh-huh. peg wood, and I gave it a little scratch on the back of the lug, and the knife went <laughs> into it like a warm knife into butter. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, now I'm questioning. Maybe a tiny fraction of of moonshine so a gold. A tiny in it. fraction. Yeah. So a tiny fraction of gold. And what price do you think it'll be? Higher, lower, or around the same? I still think slightly higher now i'm thinking maybe 50 dollars more slightly higher 50 but okay see i think I, I mean you own one of the platinum swatches don't you what do you not own a platinum swatch watch no 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 the oh what's it called i can't remember the name of it no i always talk about it because it shocks people and i know we had yeah. one in work and people didn't know what it was and they thought it was a fake a fake watch and i had to educate people that it was actually a watch that that we'd made so swatch have made watches in precious metals they have yes good point richard yeah so there you go Mm. so there you go so i because i'm reckoning i I, well okay because it's going to be the outlier i'm going that this does contain real gold Mm -hmm. and it's going to be significantly more expensive but still quartz than the previous one but still quartz Mm. i don't i don't think well because that platinum swatch before Mm -hmm. it was mechanical and it was a yeah, mechanical true. movement you could actually service. It was the case. Right, the okay. case was different from regular swatch watches where you can't open them up. Same as on System 51s and stuff. You could actually service the movement on this, which obviously you'd want to if you buy a platinum watch of any type. <laughs> oh, well, let's add that as a question. So mechanical or quartz then, Alex? I think it's still... Uh, that's why I think it's going to be cheaper. It still has to be quartz. Uh, yeah, I can't think of... the the swatch make any mechanical chronographs i can't think of any don't know david what do you think is there going to be real gold in this Mm, i think it's going to have at least five microns of gold um (laughs) maybe maybe six (laughs) we'll see uh i well i wouldn't be surprised if they made a solid gold version as well i mean we've seen solid gold g-shock before and and stuff like Uh that so oh interesting and and it's also like i'm really not sure i'm I, i think Again, there's there's been so much confusion over the moon swatch. Like, is this an Omega now? Is this is this a swatch? Is uh-huh. this a real watch? Is this a quartz? Is this mechanical? Is this a real moon watch? I wouldn't be surprised if they made a PVD version moonshine gold and then a solid gold one, and they would be really difficult to tell apart. <laughs> and one would be like <laughs> one would be like I don't know, like four hundred dollars, and then the other one is fourteen thousand. Let's see. <laughs> I thought it was interesting that there hasn't been as the same push on Omega social media as there was the last time, or I, I certainly haven't seen it. It's all been purely Swatch social media. Like, the, like this is like the Moon Swatch is now our baby. We're running with this, uh-huh. but for the initial launch, Omega were yeah are just as involved as as Swatch were. Yeah, good point. Good point. Price then, David of the non full gold version around about the same a little bit more expensive yeah maybe it may just a tiny little bit more expensive and that's about it okay and quartz or mechanical oh for sure the same movement same dial layout that's going to to arrive i'm i'm just keeping my hopes up for something that is a little bit more exciting and more out there than just a pvd coated version of the same watch but we'll see 
Okay, well, then in that case, then to be different, just in case it comes off, I'll go for lots of gold on it. Very expensive and mechanical, and we'll see. We'll see how it goes. The same groups that got on the hype train about it and caused the hype like hype beast etc are right behind this i'm not aware that there's been secret media discussions the way that there was last time when they brought four or five publications into swatch group and revealed to kind of get the opinion (laughs) of the journalists before they released it i think they know they've got a success on their hands so there's now no need to do that kind of research but it will be interesting to see just how long the scalping queues are at various swatch boutiques. It also does appear to be a very limited launch. Right, they're clearly launching it in these four or five boutiques in Europe and Asia. I've not seen any sign that this is available in the States. There's been no notification that I'm aware of of come to swatch boutique in Times Square and see this all appears to be London. Is it London? Vienna? Zurich. And Zurich, Milan, Zurich, and Tokyo, yeah, etc. So, also, it's launching early in Japan, which is odd. Like mm. for a watch company, they've not managed to coordinate their times. Like you know, it's just weird. Like they know it's going to sell out, launch at the same time everywhere. You don't need to form the queue early in Japan. <laughs> It'll still sell fine the next morning. How hard is it to launch a watch? Really, it's like. <laughs> <laughs> last time it was it was a hot mess terrible customer experience just awful for everyone involved in any form the watch industry is still fairly new that's the thing they're going to work things out eventually it's just it's still <laughs> teething the teething stage of working out how to do things oh my god <laughs> so we'll, we will be producing no doubt photos from the long queues outside swatch in london i haven't actually seen anybody on twitter tweet any pictures but i'm assuming there is already a queue outside the boutique in London and in Milan and Tokyo. But uh, I've not actually seen images of it yet. But we shall see. So we will now, if this works, cut over to what actually happened. Well, here we go with the Moose Watch Moonshine Gold Edition. And, uh, well, I don't think it's a stretch to say that it is a bit of a disappointment, really. Uh, Not just because it's not dripping uh, of moonshine gold, but also because it's more uh, what feels like artificial scarcity uh, for the moon swatch. It's basically an edition that has limited production. They are not saying, you know, if it's limited in quantity or anything like that, but they also say that they only made these moonshine gold plated hands for this edition for a single day. Uh, at least that's what we understand from the, from the press release. And so it's really an odd thing to do, and it's just more scarcity for the Moon's Watch. And that tells me it is as though we had forgotten how frustrated people were when they couldn't get their hands on these watches a year ago when they debuted in March 2022. Uh, and, uh, well, here's some more of that for you guys, if you are willing to go and now actually travel to one of the four different locations where these watches are launched again in extremely limited quantity so i think it's fair to say that i was the most wrong of everybody and i half expect alex is so annoyed at the whole situation that he'll not even show up and give us a response so i shall sigh on his behalf (sighs) i would just like to know which child of which director of swatch is obsessed with Twilight Saga because this appears to have been a moon swatch created on the back of somebody watching a TV show about werewolves and trying to join the whole thing together. The idea that the gold was struck when there's a full moon is just simply the most ridiculous thing I've heard in quite a long time in the watch world. But I'm sure somebody will manage to surpass it eventually one day. It is quite a nice looking watch. It is obviously competitively priced uh, amongst all the rest. If you like it, go buy one. But I suspect most people will just leave it to the flippers to flip out over it and the rest of us will just stand back and watch the queues. Do check out David's article at a blog to watch with full coverage of this. It's very much worth a read. So I win for getting closest to the price but ultimately we all lose (laughs) with this new moon swatch 
whenever people ask me why I have so much hatred for sales and marketing people within the watch industry, I'm just going to point them in the direction of the moon swatch moonshine from now on. Can you even imagine being in the meeting where people came up with this idea and think about how many hours, days must have been spent behind this totally pointless project. I feel like they definitely should highlight the person that came up with the idea of only making the hands in a full moon. I haven't heard something quite so ridiculous in a long time and I hear a lot of ridiculous stuff. So from this point on though, like where can the moon swatch go? Do they bounce back from this? Or is it the star that shines twice as bright shines for half as long and it just gets worse from here, although I'm not sure where that could go. Watches and Wonders is coming thick and fast and we have a very special interview with the man that makes it all happen at the Watches and Wonders Geneva Foundation, the WWGF, and that is the Chief Executive Officer, Matthew Humer. Humer? Matthew Humer. You'll find that I mispronounced his name on the interview as well. So get used to it. Matthew, very excited and enthusiastic in his new role there. And I'm sure that comes across that Watson Wonders has really expanded beyond what is going to happen at PAL Expo. And it sounds like it's going to be a cracking week. So here is our first interview with Matthew. We welcome to the show Matthew from Watches and Wonders Geneva itself. We've done a tour of the show in the previous weeks, but we thought we'd go to the main man and find out just how nervous he is in the run-up to his first Watches and Wonders as the guy in charge. So, Matthew, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm good. Thank you very much, Rick. Uh, great to speak with you today. Have you chewed your nails down to the quick yet in preparation? No, it's the <laughs> last round before the opening of Watch Sound of Geneva. Yeah, absolutely. Now, it's a bit of a change of scenery for you. Uh, this is your first Watch and Wonders as the main person. Previously, you were at the FHH. Compare and contrast the stresses and strains of the two organizations. So after the success of Watch and Wonder of Geneva in 2022, Rolex, Richemont and Patek Philippe have decided to create the, the Watch and Wonder of Geneva Foundation uh, and share a commitment to the future of this event. Mm -hmm. This was a, a, a natural move to have a, a fully dedicated organization for, for the Salon. The mission of the foundation that is based in, in Geneva and, and created uh, in 2022 is really to promote watchmaking excellence throughout the world with the purpose to organize on-site and online events with Watch and Wonder Geneva being the, the master one. In terms of organization, we have a foundation board and an exhibiting committee made of representatives from the participating maison who take all the decisions to ensure Watch and Wonder Geneva runs perfectly. And important also to know that Watch Under Geneva and FHH are two different foundations with different goals and different teams. And FHH continues, of course, to exist with all the cultural activities. Are you missing FHH? It's maybe a slightly less stress, slightly less all about the one thing than Watch and Wonders is just leading to a great big event. There are so many things to do with Watches and Wonder of Geneva that I do not have time to, to think back and I'm already focused on, on next Watches and Wonder of Geneva. Good, good. Well, let's talk about this one first. How does this differ from 2022? What can we expect to see that's different? I know there is a, a much wider reach of this year's show. Yeah, many, many novelties and new wonders for this uh, 2023 edition. One of the major moves comes from the fact that we are opening our doors to the general public for the weekend uh, on April the 1st and 2nd. So it will be a unique opportunity for the visitors to discover the, the marvels unveiled by the Maison and, and really to dive into this world of exceptional watches. The idea is really to make Geneva the destination for, for watchmaking and associate the, the public to this event. 
And we have built a, a program designed for them, for the general public in Pal Expo during the weekend with a lot of content to, to discover, such as conferences uh, in the auditorium. We will have experts that will decipher what's making trends or, or explain how to start a watch collection, for example. We will also have a new lab area, a new hub that will be one of the high tech where the visitors uh, will be able to, to re-experience the latest innovations from the Maison, but also we'll have a project from startups and school in this area. And not to be missed also an exhibition, the, the What Time Is It exhibition by the artist and photographer, Karine Bozin, illustrating the, the watchmaking history. Important uh, because for the first time, Watches and Wonders will also be held in the city of Geneva, outside the world of Pal Expo, to extend to the heart of Geneva with a world program that we will have during the entire week. For example, we will have many in store animation and activation with events planned in all the Watches and Wonders Geneva boutique, uh, with presentation of exceptional uh, pieces, know how, cocktails in the boutique of the Watches and Wonders Maison but also a watch rally, guided tours organized during the entire week to bring the visitors to the different watchmaking points of interest in the city and also in the boutique of the Watches and Models Maison. Last but not the least, we will have a big party, a big, uh, a big celebration for everyone on March Thursday the 30th from 5 to 9 p.m., we will celebrate uh, watchmaking all together uh, uh, between the musical stages, street entertainment, artists, and the concert of a famous uh, DJ. So put it on your calendar because really the, the heart of, uh, of Geneva will beat to the rhythm of watchmaking movement during the entire week. Where will that particular expression of watchmaking uh, partying be in Geneva, be right down at the harbour side or somewhere in the centre? It's a really the a watchmaking celebration for everyone. And we are very happy and excited to, to welcome the, the general public in Pal Expo, but also to, to do the celebration in the city, in the boutique, uh, with all the content we will have to discover and all the wonders that uh, the visitors will, will be able to see in the city and in Geneva Pal Expo. And is there a particular location in Geneva that will be, I don't know, a marquee or a location that you would hope people from the city and other people visiting who maybe don't even realise there's a watch exhibition on will migrate towards? Yeah, we'll have animation in the in all the streets, the Rue Bas, close to the okay. boutique of the Watches and Wonders brands. And the, our guided tours will start from the offices of Pont de la Machine. Uh, we'll have different tours with different thematics and a lot of content, a lot of wonders for the watch aficionados and the general public to, to discover with our experts. Perfect. Sounds great. There's a lot more exhibitors this year than there were last year. Who are you looking forward to seeing that you've maybe not seen before? Yes, uh, this year we are welcoming 10 new exhibitors huh, for a total of 48 maisons. We had uh, 38 in 2022. This year we are welcoming Frédéric Constant, Pékinier, Chariol, uh, Chrono Suisse are some of them. They will be located at a very central area next to the Maison already present in the previous editions. So this is uh, very exciting to see those newcomers joining Watches and Wonders this year. It really brings uh, an additional touch to the Salon and, uh, and new brands to, to discover. Now, we touched on it at the beginning about you biting your nails down to the quick as the first day approaches. What is keeping you up at night at the moment? What's the most exciting thing? And what at the moment is the biggest challenge? I will say that uh, it's always very exciting to experience the, the last hours of the setting up in order to be ready for the big opening. You know, we, we have to be on time. Huh? We, we have no choice on March 27 <laughs> at 8.30 a.m. Everything has to be perfect in order to welcome the first visitors. And what is among us is, is also the great work of those working behind the scenes huh, to bring this industry to light. Brands, booth builder, electrician, 
technicians. They are among 1,500 people working during the setup, more than 4,000 trucks, and not to forget uh, all the digital team working on, uh, on delivering the most beautiful online platform. So it's clearly a big city, a big organization, and a lot of, co a lot of coordination between the Maison and the organization to bring Watches and Wonders Geneva to life. No, very much looking forward to it. Now, one last question. Because you're the guy in charge, there must also be something that you've ended up having to get involved in that you just did not think you would ever have to get involved in. Like something small, something random, something fascinating in the organisation of this show. Is there something that stands out as just being the really odd thing that you have had to deal with so far in the running of the show? You know, with our uh, role, we are, Watch from Lord Geneva is in a central position among many brands that are all very different. That's really the beauty of, of the job because watchmaking is such a passionate, creative and, and dynamic industry with beautiful crafts and know-how. And uh, it's, of course, you know, every year a, a challenge to offer with Watch and Wonder Geneva, the best watchmaking platform that is suitable for the major maison, but also for smaller brands and independent watchmaker. That's what is beautiful in, in the mission is that we really see all the different brands and we are here to offer the best platform for all of them. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Matthew. I very much look forward to speaking to you as the day approaches of the opening and we will see what you end up biting you've obviously finished your fingernails i'm not sure what's next in terms of as it gets closer and closer to the day but thank you very much for joining us on today's show and we will speak to you again in a couple of weeks time thank you thank you thank you very much Rick. okay how excited are you alex about watching wonders from however many thousands of miles away are you expecting that you're going to be surprised or are you expecting, yeah, it's going to be the same sort of thing. Rolex is going to do their thing. Tudor are going to do their thing. And it'll be something random that pops up that's actually, you know what, that's actually quite novel. That is a genuine novelty rather than just a tweaking that's normally the way it works. The things you tend to get overexcited about, it's like a big night out, you plan it, and then it's a letdown. It's the unexpected events that actually end up being enjoyable i don't know the the thing with new releases and stuff they always get hyped up so much and i'm just used to hearing the same thing over and over again from all the big watch guys this is amazing you're gonna you're not gonna be able to believe your eyes when you see this new royal oak uh, that's gonna change the watch and so i'm so immune to just all watch stuff like that now so I just kind of come along at the end, kind of kick through the ashes and see if there's anything even remotely interesting there. But I think it's it's all the big guys, right? So there's not going to be anything too too crazy. Maybe something interesting from Tudor, maybe. Rolex are in a lucky position because when they do something even slightly kind of out of character, that's like such a big deal for them. So they don't need to try as hard as probably some of the other brands do. I think it's interesting that they have got rid of one of the areas from last year and expanded the number of smaller brands. So I think there's now 10, 12, maybe 20 small brands that are in the PAL Expo. And that's your kind of Ferdinand Bertuths and you know, uh, Shapex and these kind of these kind of brands. So I dare say that something particularly novel will come out there. I do know of one or two of the big brands that have one or two very interesting watches that are coming. So it will be interesting to see just what reaction that gets. I think there's one brand in particular that will likely be an early, early star of, of what's going to come out at the show. So we're a couple of weeks out, David, from the show. Are expectations with yourself growing or are you keeping it calm and on the level because you've been there and done that so many times before? Uh, I'm just looking forward to it. Uh, that's all. I'm just excited to be there, to, to feel that vibe. And it's just a big event for the industry. It's, it's the biggest event. And uh, 
yeah it's i i always look forward to it but to be there it's 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 an event um it's exciting but it's not like ooh, what's gonna happen next N- nothing it's <laughs> it's basically a bunch <laughs> of watches that are that are okay and it's it's weird because i feel like there should be some sort of a disruptive moment or something like that and those brands that were disruptive and became super successful because of it like you blow richard meal and some others, they have really settled down now. The, you know, the, the the level of resonance and, and whatever else that we feel from them, it's just super normal now. Sure, they make nice new iterations of the watches that they have already made, but there's not one Richard Mille figure or Biver figure, uh, you know, in action at the moment. Everyone's trying to keep their things together and, and just hold their things together. And if you look at what current CEOs are doing with their brands, they're trying to either not mess it up what they already have, or they are trying to build mm-hmm. something out of the mess that they were handed, you know, that goes for Parmigiani, for Zenit, for, for some others that are really trying very hard to become very attractive across the board. And whether or not mm-hmm. they can do that is is where the action is right now in the watch industry. It's not like who's going to put like a, a rubber strap on a gold watch. We, we've seen we've seen that Rolex is doing that now. Patek is doing that now. So I just wonder what is the next thing. And maybe what would help in the meantime is if the organizers had the likes of Citizen and Casio and Seiko, not Brown Seiko, but Seiko join the pack at Watches and Wonders. That, that could spice things up a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think what Matthew was saying, there is significantly more going on this year, significantly more engagement with lots of other things that are going on in Geneva and the show is growing. And, you know, I think next year, you know, this year is probably really the first year of the show because you've got the Far Eastern contingent coming. I certainly know from speaking to the brands, the number of East Asian Chinese that are visiting this year is, you know, a hundred times more than it was last year. Effectively, the countries were closed last year for getting into Switzerland, I think. So I think the show will feel a lot more buzzy this year. There's be a lot more people. So it will be interesting to see. And Biver is back. So, you know, we've got that to look forward to. Maybe maybe the original disruptor will disrupt again when we hear from him just before the show, I believe. Quick whistle top two of the brands in the main concourse that we've not dealt with. So, starter for 10. Well, I'll read out the list of those who I've not spoken of. Uh, kind of like the Wheel of Fortune. Tell me when to stop when you've got something interesting to say. So, Cartier, Panerai. And if you don't stop me at all, no, I'll just keep I, going I, I wanted like to stop you when I was on mute. Stop it, Cartier. <laughs> <laughs> Cartier is fun. There you go. Cartier is fun. It's always fun. Cartier have the biggest stand in the place. They actually have two stands in the show. Yeah. Cartier 1 and Cartier 2. Yeah. Uh, it was a really fun stand last year. Mm-hmm. Are you expecting great things? Yeah. What would you like to see? Uh, I, I, you know, it, it's, there's always something hilarious at Cartier. Like last year, it was they, they created this Pasha chronograph that looked like the uh, Daytona de Cartier, <laughs> basically. Uh-huh. <laughs> it, it had such a strong, weird, hybrid Daytona Pasha vibe that was hilarious. And too but Aria wrote it up I really wanted to write it up but maybe I'm going to write an alternative article because it was just hysterical but it was fun and they always create some of these exciting models with NML with even on the cases some cool movements here and there so um and and again Cartier is one of those big brands like Rolex for example that has so many watches and it is so 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 important for the industry and yet they can afford to have a more playful side as well as opposed to just bumping out the regular production pieces. So, yeah, sure. Why not? Cartier. Okay, Cartier. Panerai. Who wants to take Panerai? It's maybe more like, what's that TV show where they, you know, you have to, not have I got news for you. What was the panel show where they throw out a topic? Mock the Week? No, not Mock the Week, where they... Whose line is it anyway? Fork. Whose line is it anyway? That's what it is. This is like the Whose Line Is It Anyway? Okay. Of Watches and Wonders. Who wants I'll to take, take Panerai? I'll take Panerai. I think Panerai okay. still has potential there, but they've kind of gone off track a while back. I always say that they've got one of the most dedicated fan bases in the watch industry, which I still stand by. But I think they're kind of struggling for ideas of what to do just to keep some forward momentum, which is the main the main issue, but at the, at the risk of alienating their existing their existing fans. 
So hopefully they come out with something interesting, something that's not too cheesy. I don't want to see any more kind of super complicated things or skeletonized dials or like I wanted to get back to basics, but do it in a new and exciting way that engages their existing loyal fan base, but also brings new people into the fold as well. Well, I think the expectation is that will be a big year for Radio Mirror as it's an anniversary. So I think that will probably be the focus. Who wants to take JLC? I should probably just say, David, take JLC because you want to do it. JJ Leco. That's the, that's the thing. <laughs> JJ Leco. JJ Leco. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god that's just the best it, 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 it spent like at one point s- several months trying to find that video it's uh i think it, you guys really should look it up maybe it's it's a signed bite it's also worthwhile to add we've all seen it well if i can find it again i'll insert it in jj laco and if you're not familiar with jj laco you may not be that familiar with timepieces but what jj laco is so will GLC be more JJ Leco or more Jager Lecoultre this year, David? Uh, I think it's it's going to have at least a little bit of no. It's it's not gonna have any of the JJ vibe to it anymore. It's just JJ Lecoultre, <laughs> you know, an an anniversary JJ. Yeah, and it's I wish I wish it had this <laughs> this this hilarious take on uh, you know respect to it. Um, I keep coming back to that watch um, that I had, the uh, the Master Compressor Navy Seals that they say that they made in collaboration with the Navy Seals. And they made this black strap for it, and the whole watch like, was like kind of stealthy. And then they added a polished bevel across the, 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 the profile of the case, you know, that reflects... You can see it from the moon, basically. So imagine you're a Navy SEAL and you're just, like, rising up from a muddy, like, whatever, and <laughs> undergrowth, <laughs> undergrowth, and you're trying to hunt down somebody and then the moonlight just <laughs> reflects off your Jachère. Ridic- it was ridiculous and it was true to Jachère in some way because of, they were like, oh, of course you have to have the bevel. And, <laughs> and they did do that. And I, 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 I wish that they still had this sort of uh, humor a little bit and then they had the extreme laps mm. and all those crazy crazy watches that we just no longer see and whenever there's a gyro tourbillon or whatever like a couple of years ago it either doesn't work or it has this vibe to it that it was developed like 10 years ago and they're launching it now so i um again i'm, I'm being very hard on very difficult with uh with uh with Jager, but i really hope that we will see something exciting that is not i think okay here's the question will we see a non-anniversary or non-vintage inspired Jager this year no probably not but i would lose my marbles if jlc actually produced a proper sports watch mm. you know that would just that almost certainly even if i didn't like it it would steal the show and show that jlc were going back to to that kind of ability to do anything mm. rather than just delving into the archives Fun but they'll probably days. just produce something else that they try to refer to this was used to play polo in, which it clearly wasn't, as someone who knows about polo. It's just not nah. a word of it. Anyway, right. Bomb and Mercy. I'll take Bomb and Mercy. I think these guys are going to have a good year. I think these guys, the, yep. I think they always suffer a bit from being the first booth in the door on the right-hand side yes. with Rolex are on the left. But actually, I think this brand might attract a bit more attention mm-hmm. this year. I think they've got some good watches it's competitively priced it's kind of your entry level into the world of Richemont yes. so I'm quite excited to see what they do it's a great little brand for sure I, I really like Bowman Mercy yeah. Ulsi look at me pronouncing it correctly Ulsi Narda David I think this is one of yours as well yeah uh, pff, well you, you can never know what to expect from them I, I remember I think it was like two years ago or something like that we were doing this meeting at, at, at the HQ they were showing us some pieces and then uh, one of the, the I think it's the head of uh, product development uh, Jean-Christophe with whom we've uh, recorded a podcast actually Geneva yeah. Warriors says he walked out and you know we greet each other and I, I tease him and I'm like, it just out of nowhere it comes into my mind like what's up with the moonstruck and then he smiles and then he brings you out this perfectly <laughs> complete prototype on the moonstruck and i was like whoa okay here it is and then of course they launched it and and uh it's a fantastic piece so again it's 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 not on you never know what's gonna happen i i really look forward to them okay piaget alex you haven't spoken for a few minutes you get landed with piaget like um i love piaget actually it's one of the the few 
watch events that I've been, first of all, invited to, but also secondly, enjoyed. And I think when it comes to dress watches, they're really very difficult to, to beat. I think a bit like Panerai, with their, where they're stuck in that kind of one kind of tool watch look, they're a bit kind of stuck in that dress watch department as well and struggle to break free of that. Um, and I don't think they get enough love from the watch community. I think they should be more appreciated than they are. I still prefer their, when they had their effort at the thinnest watch in the world, the thinnest mechanical watch, I still much preferred that over the Bulgari one or the, certainly more than the Richard Mule one. <laughs> so I'd like to see them do something a bit more exciting. Maybe it's time for them to regain the, their crown as the thinnest watch in the world because everyone's kind of forgotten about that now and they think that that competition's over so it'd be great to see them maybe come back with something like that but different from their their kind of standard dress watch design and finally hermes mm. i think this is one of these brands that still slightly falls between two stools of watch brand versus fashion house but i don't think they've in you know the last few shows that they've been at of various things last few years of production everything's been brilliant everything's been like yeah you might not be your taste or anything but uh, difficult to criticize they do appear to come up with really great watches i'll let you both have a go at hermes if you wish this is like the final yeah. stand where everybody gets to line up and uh, <laughs> My, my my problem with hermes is that uh sure they make some really nice watches but at the same time i feel like they could just stop making them tomorrow and you never know. And there's this no perpetuity. Mm. There's no, well, there is some consistency across the different uh, design elements and iconic elements to design, you know, at Hermes. And that's great. Like the Arso watch or Arco, I think it's yeah. Arso watch. It's, it's beautiful with this asymmetrical design. And there, there, have, there have been some whimsical, more highly complicated pieces as well. I would still... Every once in a while, I search for a Le Temps Suspendu uh, watch um, on Chrono 24, and you can buy them at reasonable prices. That was fantastic. So the quality is there, and the design, at least some of the time, is is spot on. But at the same time, I also feel like, sure, I could drop like five or six grand on a, on a brand that may or may not exist tomorrow, you know, if they decide to just stop making watches. So this has such a strong side project vibe to it, even though it's done uh, brilliantly well. Good, good. Well, that is us completed our main tour of all things Watch and Wonders. Be interested to hear from you as to what you're excited about, dear listener. So do email the show podcast at a blog to watch dot com or get in touch with us on our various Instagram accounts or indeed search out the Discord server in which you can join and take part in various chats about various topics. Although, interestingly, the main thing that seems to be trending in our Discord server is folk posting pictures of their pets. But there you go. <laughs> That's watch people for you. That's us. Alex, what are you up to and where can people find you on the internet? They can find me on the semi-somewhat regular Robin Regulator podcast and Two and a Half Watchmakers podcast. Um, which I'm not doing one tonight, so I was hoping this one would go on for a few more hours, but that's that's all right. <laughs> Did you, you get with, withdrawal symptoms when you don't have a five-hour podcast? Look forward to well, recording. Well, this is always my warm-up when I come on here. It's always a Tuesday. <laughs> it's the limbering up, getting me ready for the uh -huh. five hours afterwards. But yeah, it's fine. Okay, uh, David, where can people find you on the internet? It's abtw underscore david, and of course, the block the com. And have you taken delivery of the watch that you trailed last week? Hysterically, not yet. I'm taking delivery today <laughs> because ah. uh, it's such a popular watch that they're showing it to VIP clients and stuff. <laughs> they're showing it to people that actually want to buy it before they show it to you. It, it happened last time too. <laughs> last time I got two of these, you know, two two of these different watches, but from the same brand, and they were like, "Well, we might sell it." <laughs> wow. <laughs> so that's funny. Good stuff. Well. We look forward to seeing that when you finally reveal to the world what it is. I know what it is, and it's very cool. So you can find me at, at Rick TikTok on Instagram. Thank you for joining us. Tune in again next week. Goodbye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Catch you next week. Hey, guys, it's Simon from Escapement24. So I was super excited when I saw the teaser trailer for a new Moon Swatch, so much so that I quickly rushed out a video speculating on what we might be about to see. Clearly, I wasn't the only one who was really excited about this because that video absolutely exploded. Now that we've actually seen the watch, you wanted to know my initial reactions, so here goes. <sighs> 
Do you know what? I thought the new Moon Swatch Moonshine Gold was actually quite fun. I know it's not a particularly exciting thing and the reveal was all a little bit uh, deflated, but the speculation and the fun and the coming together of the community felt as fresh as it did last year. Why not? It's just a bit of fun. It's not very expensive. There are queues of people looking to buy one and sell one on eBay, but nevertheless, yeah, it's really fun. I really enjoyed it. Hey everyone, Mike Razek here to complain about the new Moon Swatch Moonshine. This is a standard gray case, black dial, but with an inane and contrived twist of a gold hand forged during the full moon. Spooky stuff may be more appropriate for a JK Rowling book than for a Swatch group, but here we are. So the new Moon Swatch was announced, and while I think it was disappointing to most people, maybe everybody bought into the hype, thought it was going to be something that it was never going to be. So I think in some ways, Swatch became a victim of its own success. Thinking about it critically, it's a $285 plastic watch. I think we were hoping for too much for something that it wasn't going to be. The second hand being replaced by a gold-plated hand, I think is somewhat appropriate for a watch that's under $300. Hi Jackie. I've been allowed out. I'm allowed to talk more than just the intro. So, Swatch released a new Moon Swatch watch? The thoughts, feelings, emotions? Oh, I have lots of those. Do you mean about the watch or just generally? <laughs> Specifically watch related. Preferably Moon Swatch. I like it. Oh, okay. Don't you? Yes, but I, I can't roll my eyes any more than I have been. Looking at it, fine. All of the wishy-washiness behind it absolutely ridiculous but i think annoyingly it will work it will sell well i mean i could be clever about well i couldn't actually i'd have to read in order to be clever about it but when i look at it i think it's nice the only thing that i will say is my strongest feeling is are they trying to be rolex because oh. they're creating watches that no one can buy as in they're going to be hard to get hold of and that feels like a rolex vibe yeah not here for it i have to say i just don't like it because it's plastic and ridiculous 